Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Carol Walker, the Executive Director of the East Hawaii Cultural Center, and I would like to welcome you to our latest talk in the EHCC Lecture Series Online, Roots and Routes Along Keokaha's Seashore, presented by Helena Kapuni Reynolds. And I'm quite sincere when I say it is truly my pleasure to introduce Helena. He was born on Hawaii Island and raised in the Hawaiian homestead community of Kealkaha and the upper rainforest of Ola'a. He holds a BA in Anthropology and Hawaiian Studies from the University of Hawaii at Hilo and an MA in Anthropology with a focus in Museum and Heritage Studies from the University of Denver and is currently a doctoral student in Museum Studies and American Studies at the University of Hawaii Manoa. He is a past participant in the Smithsonian Institute of Museum Anthropology and the Peabody Essex Museum Native American Fellowship Program. He has co-organized a range of museum-related events in Hawaii, including a 2020 program series on cultural competence in Hawaiian museums. He is also a 2017 recipient of a Ford Foundation Predoctoral Fellowship. And among the works he has authored is a piece that is relevant to today's presentation, Napana Kaulana o Keokaha, The Storied Places of Keokaha, an essay on the places of the Keokaha coastline that was published in Detours, a decolonial guide to Hawaii by Duke University Press in 2019. So beyond those dry standard facts, I am very happy to add on a more personal note that Helena is a member of EHCC's advisory council, and I can certainly attest to the fact that he does give excellent advice. And I'm also happy to report that Helena will soon be taking on an exciting new role as at Associate Curator of Native Hawaiian History and Culture at the National Museum of the American Indian, a unit of the Smithsonian Institution. Congratulations, Helena. And now I will return it, I will turn the floor over to you, Helena. Thank you very much, Carol, for that wonderful introduction. And aloha mai kako, it's so nice to see everybody. Now, for tonight's presentation, and this is what I oftentimes do, I prepare a script so that I don't ramble too long. Because as you know, we can talk story, and talk story can take us all over the place. But for the purpose of this presentation, the script helps me to stay on point. Um, so you'll see me kind of reading off of it. Uh, since we have such an intimate crowd, I do encourage folks to use the chat option as I'm presenting. If anything comes to mind, any manao they'd like to share with each other, um, please do so. I want this to be a space where we can come together to learn about these, these mo'olelo, these stories, these place names from my community, um, just as a way to, to, to think about them, but to also encourage folks to be the thinkers uh, when it comes to these places and these histories. All right, so without further ado, I will share my screen and we will proceed. All right, let me open up my chat so I can see this as I present. Velina mai kako e na hoa maka maka mai ka piina kala i ha e ha ea hiki ka mole oluole hua a mai kahi kihia i kahi kihio ka honua nei. Na kanaka e o no hoi i e e me ka pono a me ka lana kila ma luna o ka puna i vele puni honua i mea e a koa koa i i ke ia hi a hi no ka ho olohe ana mai i ke ia ha i o lalo nei. Aloha pumehana ya kako pakahi apau. Greetings everyone and thank you for joining me today on this visual, textual, and digital journey. I'd like to begin by first wishing all of you and your ohana well during these times. And I'd also like to thank the East Hawaii Cultural Center for this opportunity to present some of my research. The shift from meeting physically in person to using our computers and webcams to maintain our connections with one another has been a roller coaster ride to say the least. It has offered challenges and opportunities to reconnect, to expand our network of relations, and to continue thinking through the ways that digital web-based technologies enhance our lives. Personally, having spent much time over the last few years at home made me appreciate those places that I used to frequent before the pandemic, places that have been central to my health and well-being as a Kanaka Oivi of Hawaii Island, 
places that require our care and attention if they are to be there in the future for our keiki and mo'opuna to enjoy and to connect with, places that actively shape our identity and connections to one another in a world of uncertainty. Today in this presentation, I'd like to dwell on the relationships that we have to particular places by examining tu hua ka'ihele, which I'll define later, well actually, or sightseeing tours is a very generic uh, definition of that, uh, that took place in the 1920s on Hawaii Island. These hua ka'ihele were documented by Theodore Kelsey and led respectively by Henry Nalimu and Mary Ka'ou Lionalani Pahi'o Ka'ai. Two longtime residents of Hilo with intimate knowledge of the many storied places known as Vahipana that exists within the land area known as Keokaha. Today's presentation consists of the following. So first, I'd like to set the stage with a personal story about growing up in Keokaha. Second, I describe how huaka'i hele is a Hawaiian genre of transmitting history orally and kinesthetically through the act of visiting Vahipana sequentially along a given path. Third, I dive into Nalimu and Ka'o Lionalani's huaka'i hele and offer some commentary along the way. And lastly, by attending to historical huaka'i hele along Keokaha's coastline, this presentation encourages Kama'aina and Malihini, longtime residents, guests, and visitors to connect to our Vahipana and to learn more about the histories that coalesce in the lands and waters that surround us. For those with ties to Keokaha, this means actively practicing Huaka'i Hele as a means of reclaiming our community's history by drawing on ancestral memories and documents to make new memories of the places that we hold dear. Now, before I move any further, I do want to put out a quick disclaimer. If you are not from Keokaha or you are a Malihini indeed, um, please do not go to places that aren't meant for you, i.e. do not go into the bushes along the coastline if it's not a very safe path, if you're not familiar with the area. Um, visit the public parks that we do have that have infrastructure in place, that have pathways. This is mostly to encourage folks to utilize spaces that are already developed, but also to make sure that the places that aren't developed can rest, can be protected, and can be made accessible and you know, left in that state for the Kanaka and the folks who use those areas for subsistence fishing in particular. So although I encourage Wakaihale across the coastline, you want to do that with folks from the community. Um, you want to do that if you're invited to do so or the opportunity is put out there to participate in something like this. Uh, very important to keep in mind um, when we do this kind of work. So this presentation is a continuation of my dissertation research into relearning the names of Keokaha's Vahipana, as well as the stories found in my community. And as Carol mentioned, in 2019, I, along with my aunt Mapuana Waipa, who is here today, uh, a Kama'aina of Keokaha, co-authored a chapter in Detours, A Decolonial Guide to Hawaii. Here's an image of the book title. Uh, it was edited by Hokulani Aikau and Bernadette Gonzalez, and our chapter was titled Napana Kaulana o Keokaha, The Storied Places of Keokaha, that narrated a typical kind of huaka'i hele that Auntie Mapu and I conduct along a segment of the Keokaha coastline. And some of the places that we talked about in that chapter was Puhi, pictured here, Kulapai, Awili, Keokea and Keone Kahakaha. And during our textual visit to these funny Vahipana, we told stories about them to those who, um, well, it was an imaginary tour for this chapter. And we showed photographs of each place. These are some of the photographs that were included that were produced by Auntie Mapu's daughter, Lehua Nani Waipa Ane. Um, to be able to describe to the readers these different places and to really imagine what it's like on a Typical day, just walking along the coastline and learning and talking about these stories. We celebrated our vahipana through a mele vahipana, or a song commemorating story places that I composed years ago to honor these special places. And we also briefly discussed environmental issues and the impact of beach park development to the integrity of vahipana in the community. And through this chapter, we engaged with the goals of the Detours project, which was to unsettle settler touristic imaginaries and consumption practices. Well, mapping out a decolonial guide of Hawaii rooted in grassroots and place-based activism. Although we included as much as we could in the chapter, given our page limits, I mean, it could have been a 
chapter that was 50 pages long, to be honest. Uh, there were many other stories and discussions that were left out. So in this presentation is in some ways an extension of that chapter that allows us to kind of venture further on a particular path of engaging with and learning about Vahipana and those who kept them alive by sharing memories through the practice of Huaka Ihele. So let us begin this digital Huaka Ihele or this digital um, sightseeing tour of Keokaha. I am a firm believer in the ways that childhood experiences permeate our adulthood and the ways that we continue to act in and think about the world. And um, this statement holds true to my experiences as a doctoral student in the field of American studies, raised in a Hawaiian homestead community, and educated through a Hawaiian language and culture-based public charter school education in Keokaha. You see, my interest in Hua Ka'i Helen um, does not just stem from my academic interest in doctoral research, it actually begins much earlier in elementary school. There's a picture of me <laughs> and a little picture of Keokaha Elementary. Let me tell you a story. When I was a student at Kekula Kayapunio Keokaha, the predecessor to Kaumeke Ka'eo Public Charter School, I remember going on my first Huaka'i Hele along Keokaha seashore. I can't quite recall the details um, or the year it took place, but I do remember that it was organized by Kumu Kero Ioane, who is my aunt, aunt in the, and I was in the first grade. And we went on this Huaka'i Hele, the, the entire class with some of our chaperones. And I remember feeling excited when we left the school on foot, like most kids who get a chance to escape the classroom and go out into the world. And I remember feeling really excited walking down Baker Avenue under the heat of the sun to reach the cold waters of Puhi Bay. And as we approached Puhi Bay, um, we walked along the gravel and stood near a banyan tree growing along Kalaniano Ole Avenue. For, for those of you from Kilkaha, you know where this tree is and you know this, this picture. So as um, once there, our kumu began to play their ukulele, signaling to her students that we were about to share our ho'okupu, or offering, to this vahipana in the form of a mele. And the mele was one that we started to learn weeks prior. And it was a mele vahipana written by Hawaiian hula master and educator Edith Kanaka Ole, and simply titled Napana Kaulana o Keokaha, the famed storied places of Keokaha. Now, as some of you are already aware, Auntie Edith is now being celebrated on a quarter that is, has already been released. And there will be events on May 6th, I believe. It would be a Saturday at UH Hilo that is available to the public to learn more about her legacy. So if that is of interest to you folks, please um, find that information and attend. But under the banyan tree and looking towards the glistening brackish waters, we began to sing this mele. Napana ke ia o ke o ka ha Me ka pale ka ia ila heri Ha mahu i ka me he wana kukuna In Napana Kaulana, Kanaka Ole pens from memory the names of Vahipana along Keokaha's coastline, remembering those aspects of each place that make them unique and special in each lyrical verse. Since our first stop of the Huaka Ihele was Puhi, we sang Kanaka Ole's verse honoring this place. <laughs> As we sang Kanako Ole's Mele, we could see Puhi in front of our eyes. We knew about the Heiau, or this is a temple dedicated to the Mano, a shark named Kua, that she referred to. And when she named Kulapai in the mele, we could see its gradually sloping grassy hills in the distance, inviting us to tread to the edge of the water to see out towards the farthest point north of the island that we could see. And that point, which you can kind of see in this picture right over here in the corner right here, is Makahanaloa. Makahanaloa. After performing our mele at Puhi, we waited briefly for a, a ho'ailona. This is a sign from the natural world. Whether it be in the form of a cloud formation, passing showers, rippling waters, windblown treetops, or maybe even a bird majestically appearing in front of us to signal our welcome to Puhi. Once we received that ho'ailona, we dwelled there for a while, then slowly made our way to Kulapai and Awili, singing the corresponding verse at each vahipana. After leaving Awili, we made our way along the old Keokaha Road to Keokea, Kokoiki, and Keone Kahakaha, 
singing to these places their names and stories that we learned through Kanaka Ole's mele. The Huaka'i Hele eventually ended at Kione Kahakaha, and we made our way back to campus to continue with our daily lessons. As I grew older and I continued my education, many of my kumu made the effort to take their haumana to Vahipana across Hawaii Island to learn more about their homeland. Through a Hawaiian charter school education, I was able to witness the sun first, uh, where the sun first touches the land at Kumukahi, this is in Puna. I clean ancestral lo'i terraces at Napo'opo'o in Waipi'o Valley. I traveled to Kohala to visit Kamehameha's place of birth. I slept under the stars, hearing the crashing waves at Kiahialaka in the district of Puna. I stopped at Pu'uhuluhulu in the early morning to offer pule and melekomo, prayers and, and um, chants of asking for permission to enter, and made my way to the summit of Mauna Kea to visit Waiau and to leave offerings at Ku Kahau Ula. In school at Keo Kaha, I learned how to malama aina to take care of the land at places like Keo Kea, Kamokuna, and Haleolono. I went to the tide pools at Waiuli and Laihala, other places along the Keokaha shoreline, to learn more about our more than human kin that live in the rocks and crevices. I played makahiki games at Kulapai with my classmates, sweating in anticipation for the next competition. And I woke up before the morning's first light, reciting my mo'oku auhau, my genealogy, and submerging myself in the ice cold waters of Puhi as part of my high school graduation ceremony. Indeed, and in drawing from, this is a little bit more like the academic stuff, but in drawing from the work of settler colonial studies scholar Candice Fujikane, uh, Candice is a professor at UH Manoa, the labor of my kumu to ensure that their students became familiar with our vahipana across the island was one way that they taught us to map the abundance of our lands through huaka'ihele. Such a practice was and remains critical in the care of vahipana and within Hawaiian charter school education, because it resists what she calls the logic of subdivision, which she describes as a way in which um, you know, certain processes draw red boundary lines around isolated parcels of land, which then fragment vahipana into, and vahikapu, these are sacred places, into smaller and smaller isolated abstract spaces. So here she's referring to, pra to practices of land privatization that really splits um, these very special places along these really artificial boundaries of who owns what. Furthermore, my kumo also taught me the importance of care carefully observing the world around us, especially at Vahipana, a practice that really requires the ability to remain still, to listen closely, and to use our hands and bodies to feel the soil, the spring water, the oceans, the trees, the wind, and the rocks. Um, put another way, you know, um, for a lot of Hawaiian families who have stories of learning how to fish or learning how to farm, um, it relates back to that old, old, age-old practice of learning how to just watch and to not talk and to be very observant and learning from your kupuna or your elders from that process. And so this practice of being able to read the land, essentially, and, and to read your surroundings is what indigenous political scientist Noilani Gujar Ka'opua, another professor at UH Manoa, um, calls land-centered literacies, land-centered literacies, uh, which she kind of defines as ways of reading the world rooted in aloha aina, which is broadly defined as love for land and country. Thus, huaka'i hele can be regarded as an aina-based activity that fosters the development of land-centered literacies. And I'm grateful to, to many of my kumu and community in Keokaha who really took it upon themselves to teach haumana like me how to map the abundance of our homeland. And equally, I'm grateful to my own mother, Jeanette Kaunauna Toilen Kapuni Reynolds, who my cousin Kessel noted in the chat, um, who believed in Hawaiian charter school education and refused my youthful, my youthful demands to attend Kamehameha schools. <laughs> um, if it were not for my charter school and Hawaiian immersion education, I would not be speaking about this subject today. Okay, so before I continue, I want to see a really quick show of hands for folks who have their, their cameras on. Um, who has heard of this term, huaka'i hele? Raise their hands. Okay, good. Some folks. So to just kind of give you folks a sense of what huaka'i hele is, um, here is a slide. So huaka'i hele as I've kind of been showing already and talking about, and I performed with that mele by Auntie Edith, 
Um, it's a standard term that Kanaka Oivi or Kanaka Maoli, Native Hawaiians, use to describe a trip or a journey. Uh, the other term that was frequently used that you can see in historical sources is huaka'i maka'i ka'i, which more specifically talks about the act of sightseeing in a place. Huaka'i hele is more of a broader category to talk about movement across a landscape in a journey of some kind. So in Hawaiian literature, there are also numerous mo'olelo or stories where huaka'i hele play a central role in the storyline as the main characters travel across an island or multiple islands meeting kama'aina, these places who have been there, people who have been living in those places for a long time, and other deities at places that are now famed because of their visits. Examples of mo'olelo that include huaka'i hele that, I, that come immediately to mind, um, some of which are pictured here, is the mo'olelo of hi'iakai kapolio pele, la kovai, ka miki, and hina au kekele and kuahailo. Beyond these ancestral mo'olelo, kanaka Maoli writers in the 19th and early 20th century penned their huaka'i hele to paper and sent them to newspaper publishers. These accounts describe their tours around a particular island or along a particular coastline, with kama'aina always serving as alaka'i or guides to take these visitors across their lands. One of the best known examples of a published huaka'i hele that we have is the one you see on the right. This is huaka'i maka'i ka'i a kaupo maui, a visit to kaupo maui, which was an account penned by Th Thomas K. Maunupau, and he was somebody from the area who took an anthropologist from the Bishop Museum, Kenneth Emery, uh, to visit the different cultural sites in the district of Kopo on East, in, East, in East Maui. And in this account, he essentially documents where they went, who they met, the places they saw, the heiau and the structures that they encountered. And it was republished as this book in 1998 by the Bishop Museum Press, if folks are interested. When I also think about Huaka'i Hele, in Hawaiian, liter in Hawaiian literary and historical sources, sources, I think about these particular questions. Um, for instance, huaka'i hele makes us think of, makes us think maybe it can be thought of as a quote unquote Hawaiian genre convention. This is from Noelani Aristo, who is a Hawaiian historian. Um, and maybe even thinking about huaka'i hele as a way that we've transmitted history within different places across our islands for a very long time. Um, I also think about how might the way in which we write Hawaiian history change when that history is literally put into motion to consider the movement, settlement, and resettlement of peoples across the landscape, which is what we see in places like Kilkaha. And so what are some of the stories and observations that come to the fore when we shift um, our understanding and the way we write about and think about these histories to think more about people moving across the landscape, people crossing different kinds of boundaries, um, and thinking about their experiences of that kind of movement across the land, um, as opposed to, and maybe complementary to, a history focused on governance of Kanaka that are bound to particular parcels of parcels of land, um, and a history of Hawaii politics through newspapers. And I am really inspired by uh, the work of a Tanana Athabascan scholar, her name is Dion Millian, who talks about and writes about felt histories. And so what might Huaka'i Hele teach us about felt histories of Hawaii to reawaken Hawaiian modes of transmitting history and sharing our memory with our descendants? And so when I think about these questions, I don't have concrete answers yet. They're really there to get us thinking about these things. Um, but in the meantime, I am suggesting that this genre called Huaka'i Hele um, remains an understudied area within Hawaiian history and one that could really aid in writing revisionary histories that we need in our communities. So in analyzing these two huaka'i hele, and we're almost there to the actual huaka'i hele part, um, I also organize huaka'i hele when I can with folks who reach out um, and when I have the time to do so. And um, these are pictures of a huaka'i hele that Auntie Mapu and I did back in 2011. You can see how how much skinnier I was then as a UH Hilo student. Um, but this is just with a group of UH students that we took to um, from Puhi Bay to Keone Kahakaha uh, to talk about these places and to get them to engage more with the land itself. So now begins our kind of, our huaka'i hele into the archives. So in the summer of 2019, I scoured through the Theodore Kelsey manuscript collection at the Hawaii State Archives pictured here. And I knew that if I searched this collection, I might be able to find a list of place names by Henry Nalimo that I heard about 
while still an undergrad at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Now, this document I'm talking about, I've, it was when I was a much younger teenager, I saw it in different places in the community. People referenced it, but nobody really knew where to find it. <laughs> it was one of those situations where so-and-so got it and then handed out the documents and only certain people had it. And so um, there was, it was, it was kind of going into that space, hoping that I would find it again. And so um, when I got there, of course, there wasn't any folder that was named Kelkaha Placings. And so I, it was a bit of a daunting task. But when I received the finding aid, um, I was also astounded to see just how much of Kelsey's materials are stored there. And I'll talk a little bit more about who Kelsey was later. So over 25 ar 23 archival boxes consisting of over 540 numbered folders representing Kelsey's kind of lifetime, and it's not even his entire collection. He actually has materials deposited at the Bishop Museum. There's some that still remains with um, his caretakers at the end of his life. And so, I mean, Theodore Kelsey and this collection in particular has so much to offer. There's still a lot there that we haven't quite analyzed. And within this, I also found correspondence that he had with some early Kelkaha homesteaders, such as Sam Akonimika, who was a well-known hula teacher. Um, and luckily, as I went through the finding aid, I was able to kind of narrow down my search to 15 folders. And eventually I found the documents I was looking for and more. So amidst a stack of delicately discolored papers, I came across a four-page document and it's simply titled Hawaiian Place Names H.B. Nalimo. And the document was most likely produced by Kelsey who probably received a handwritten copy from Nalimo or sat down with Nalimo who at this time, um, this would have been um, a Hawaiian gentleman who would have been about 95. So sitting down with Kelsey and talking story and recording the information that he was sharing. And Within this particular document, this is the folder that you see on the right, um, Nalimu records numerous Inoa Aina or place names that he memorized over his lifetime. And more specifically, the, Ino the Inoa Aina that are listed in this document are Inoa Aina in Kilkaha, um, within the larger coastline of Ahupua'a, of Waiakea, sorry, and um, parts of Hawaii Island. So although the papers were initially out of sequence when I viewed them, I was able to reorganize them as they were written. Because as for, for folks who do a lot of work in archives, oftentimes you get a folder and it's, it might be a little bit kapakahi and might be out of place. So you have to do the best that you can to reorder that. Okay, so let's see. Although Nalimu's textual hua ka'i hele is abundant with Inua Aina and Mo'olelo, there is no date to indicate when he put these to memory. So there was no date on this particular document, but it's reasonable to suspect that this particular document that Kelsey and Nalimu produced was in the 1920s, I suspect the 1925, which is matching with other hua ka'i hele he did with folks. And just to give you a, a bit of a sense of who Henry Nalimu was, he was, well, he passed away in his late 90s. He was um, someone who early on in his life became part of the, the church in Hilo. He was somebody who worked with Titus Cohen a lot. He went away for a few years to the Gilbert Islands as a Hawaiian missionary doing work there. And he came back, um, lived much of his life in Hilo and in the P.O.P.O. PO area, which is where the Kamehameha statue is now. And a wealth of information about Hilo that much of which hasn't necessarily been published and made accessibly available outside of, um, you know, a lot of academic work or maybe exhibits, some photographs here and there. And Alimu is actually somebody who was born in 1835 and in the Hamakua district known as Kihalani. So now we go to the Huaka Ihele. This is just an example. Here's a picture of Nalimu that you see up here. Uh, from the state archives. And this is just an, uh, so you folks can see what this document looked like. This is his huaka'i hele. So let's begin. So in Nalimu's accounts, he starts by describing this place called Naola'a. Now this is a picture I took a few years ago. Um, note that some of the places he talks about, I haven't been able to quite pinpoint exactly where because of how he talks about it. And I'll, I'll share a little bit more about that. But in talking about Naola'a, he describes it as being makayaku keokea. 
seaward of Keokea. And here, Nalimu uses the directional term makai to describe where one place is located in relation to another. In this document, he also uses the term mauka in other places to denote where a place is. And I found this usage really helping, helpful and intriguing because, you know, when I think of Mauka and Makai as somebody from Keokaha, I would have thought, oh, Mauka is like towards Mauna Loa and Kilauea and not necessarily towards Mauna Kea. But when we kind of take a look at how he's using it throughout the document, we can see that Mauka oftentimes for Nalimu is referring to Mauna Kea, which you can see from the coastline. Different direction than Mauna Loa and Kilauea from what I was thinking. And so... Um, when he uses makai, he is essentially talking about places that are close that are towards Puna. When he uses mauka, he's talking about places closer to Hilo Town. And so Nalimu orients himself differently than how I would as somebody who grew up there. But the information he shares helps us also to rebuild his early life. Um, I've heard from some of his descendants that this information for them is new to them because they knew their their kupuna, their elder, lived in Pio Pio, but not that he lived in Keokaha, which is what this um, Hawaiian text is sharing with us today. So he's, let me catch myself really quickly. So spatially, Naolaa is located midway along the Keokaha coastline near Keonekahakaha. Um, so, you know, it makes us wonder, why would he start here out of all places um, to begin his kind of huakaihele via this document? And so I will just read the Hawaiian really quickly. Na o laa kela vahi makayaku o keo kea, makayaku o na o laa kumako vahi e mahi ai ai ka uala me ko umau makua, makai o aku o kono hono nui, hele wau i ka ukula i loko aka, loko aka for grandmother la ie, uh, for the grandmother of la ie ka vai, me ko u kai kaina, o vai vai ka ukumu, hele o hanapilo, a o he puka mai ka io kona leo. Translated, Thusly, it says, Naolaa, that place east of Keokea. East of Naolaa is the place that my parents and I would raise sweet potato. Makai of Hono Hono Nui. Um, I wanted to keep the Makai here because, again, the, the orientations he's using. And I went to my school at Lokoaka with my younger brother. Vai Vai was the teacher. He had a low, hoarse voice and he could not speak very well. So here we learn that Nalimu grew up in Keokaha. He begins his list of Inoa Aina at Naolaa because this was the place that was most familiar to him because this is where he was raised and he lived with his family when they were in Keokaha. Now, the best estimation that I could have of exactly when that would, when that would be would be sometime in the 1840s and 1850s, which for the names he lists here gives us a kind of time frame of when he learned these names. So the names that you see in this document um, that I'll be talking more about throughout the presentation are names from around the 1840s and the 1850s. So in his list of names, oh no, I already said that, I apologize. Okay, so Nalimu continues. So from Naolaa, he provides the boundaries of Waiakea, stating that it goes to the east to Lele'ivi Point and south towards Mauna Loa, and ends in the west towards Kalanakama stream above Hilo Town proper. Uh, following this, Nalimu returns to listing the Inoa, the Inoa Aina of Keokaha, starting again with uh, the, Inoa, the Inoa Aina within Hono Hono Nui. So Hono Hono Nui is an Iliku Pono. This is a parcel of land reserved for the chiefs due to the abundance and the resources in those areas. And Hono Hono Nui in Keokaha is Essentially, this land that you see back here behind Lokoaka, um, it is where the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation campus is at a place called Pahoaka. Um, I remember there used to be that store and tropical garden right across the street. So all of that land area is part of Hono Hono Nui. And Hono Hono Nui during the Mahele, it's another kind of his, that would be another um, presentation to go into the history of the Mahele here in Hawaii. But uh, Hono Hono Nui was claimed and awarded to Victoria Kamamalu, in addition to the Iri Kupono in Waiakea named Pio Pio that I previously mentioned. So even in the passing on of these lands to Kamamalu, there is a direct connection to this particular place in Waiakea to Pio Pio, which we also see in Nalimu's lifetime. As Nalimu provides the place names of these places, 
um, in his list, he recalls what he can and what he wants to share with Kelsey. So for example, he talks about Kapa Alaho. Um, there's a short explanation of the name, Hekaeo Kalaho, but I won't translate that for you guys today. Uh, Haleolono is another place that is listed. This is a pond that Edith Kanako Ole Foundation actively stewards. Um, and he talks about there being a Hokele Kepani, a Japanese hotel that was there. So here he's referencing something that would have existed in the early 20th century. And at Hauna, uh, there is a note made by Kelsey where he provides a variation from his niece, who I'll talk about later, Ka'o Leonalani. Um, and the variation is Hanauna. So here we're seeing two different kupuna, sharing two different spellings of the names, which drastically changes its meaning. Hauna is talking about something really smelly and stinky, which, you know, when you're thinking about kyokaha and all the organic matter that is decomposing in the rotters there, it makes sense. But Hanauna is referring to generations. And I'm not quite sure exactly what that might that meaning might be in relation to what Ka'ol Ulionalani shares. So he, after listing the names of the ponds located in Honohononui, Analimu begins to list the names of ponds located in Pio Pio. And as I mentioned, this is kind of a view of Pio Pio. We're looking towards Waiakea Pond now. Um, this is Waiakea Villas over here. But he goes to this place now to talk about um, these Vahipana. So he mentions... Places like Mohouli, Kalepolepo, and Waiahole, these are ponds within the larger kind of pond area there. Um, and then he also describes a place that's called Keakiona Va'a o Kaumelieli. So again, right, he's jumping back and forth because as I kind of imagine what he's doing with, with Kelsey, as he's talking to Kelsey, he's just kind of doing it in his mind and jumping from these different places as he remembers it. And so from P.O.P.O., from the Kamehameha statue, now we're all the way towards King's Landing. And this is where he jumps to. So by this time, he's beginning farther east at Lehia. So that area where people park at the end of the road, that is Lehia, uh, which is located right past Waiuli or Richardson's. And Lehia is where he situates what is called Kalua o Kua, the cave of Kua. And this is a famed Mano who traveled throughout Hawaii and the Hilo coastline. And he says, Kamano o kouma kupuna ame kelii kalani o pu'u, the shark of my ancestors and the chief kalani o pu'u. Kalani o pu'u was the reigning chief um, before Kamehameha Ekahi, who was his nephew. And so Nalimu continues with his huakai hele. He then um, names Waiuli, Waiolena, Kaumaui, Hawani'o, and Mahikea before discussing Honohononui again. So these are just some of the other places. Um, I jumped slides and I apologize. And Hawa Ni'o, as he describes it, is pretty easily identifiable because he describes it as a natural bay. And it was an excellent spot to bring um, canoes to shore. So here is Hawa Ni'o. Um, more from, I think folks call it Carl Smith now, right? That's the label that you see. But he situates it here. And in returning to Honohononui, Nalimu describes in little detail the boundaries of the Ili Kupono itself. More importantly, he remembers at this point that there was a place called Ala Opai, a place where he planted a kamani tree that was still growing there decades later. I don't think his kamani tree is still there, unfortunately, but what an amazing um, story to share of something that he planted in his childhood and, and was still there in his 90s. Okay. East of Honohononui is Kione Kahakaha, and in trying to describe the meaning behind the name, Nalimu says, Oyakahi i kahakaha i na keki i luna, o kione paha. That is where children may have sketched in the white sand. He continues, listing Keave Hala, a place that used to be abundant in hala trees. Um, so this would be the point. Um, if you go straight into Kione Kahakaha and go to your left past the pavilions, it's the point right there. That's Keave Hala. And he also talks about a place called Kailele, which is a bluff in the sea where the seawater would essentially jump into the air, the lele, um, where the waves would kind of break up and scatter into the wind. And when you go to this place, you can see that happening in particular places along this part of the coastline. He also talks about Ava'au. And what I really enjoy about his description for this place name is it's quite literal and it's quite easy to identify. He says, Aya a pii mai ke kai alai la pai iu ka kava'a a emi ke kai i vaho a ole hiki ke pai kava'a. 
essentially what he's saying is that you know when the tide is high you can actually bring a canoe into in from the shoreline and you can park it on top of the sand itself when there is no tide or it's when it's low tide you can't do, do that um here at Ava'au, which I think I believe folks call Brown Speech, among other names for the Kilkaha folks, you can put those names in here. Um, you know, you know, when it's low tide, it doesn't look like this. All you see is bare sand and rocks. But here is a picture at probably like mid tide that shows the water coming in. And so his description helps us to identify this place because this is the only time of day that you can bring in a canoe when, it, when the weather is like this at this particular place. So. Beyond Ava'au, he then continues. Now he's going towards Puna. He's going towards the town of Hilo. He mentions Keokea, which is the point by Ava'au. Apologies, would be in this direction. And Kulepai. So he uses the term Kulepai here. And for many folks in Keokaha, we use the term Kulapai. He also talks about Puhi. And um, he notes that at, when he was a child, again, this is the mid-1800s, he notes Puhi as being a place that was heavily populated, that there was a village. For many places along the Kilkaha coastline, he talks about places having kauhale or villages, which for many of us, you know, we've um, in the community, we've heard of those who lived along the coastline, but oftentimes we're told that there weren't many people who lived along the coast, that there was individual families. But here he is recording the abundance of people who are living all across this coastline in different villages. So beyond, at, at Puhi, he also notes that this is the home, this is the location of a sea house, a coastal home that was once owned by Emma Aiva, Emma Aima Navahi. She was the editor for a paper called Ke Aloha Aina, um, at following the, the passing of her husband, Navahi Okalanio Pu'u. Um, and this location here, for folks are, at Puhi are familiar with, this um, grassy area right here is where that house used to be. And when the Keokaha Hawaiian Homelands Community was formed back in 1924, that house served as one of the first meeting houses for the community because there was no place to meet yet. No, there was no Kona Nakua Gymnasium or anything like that. So let's continue. Beyond Puhi, oops, he talks about a place called Milo. So Milo is where the breakwater begins. Also a place that he notes as having a lot of people living there. He also names Palekai is the word that we use for breakwater itself, um, and also provides us names for places, places that we no longer have access to because of the harbor. So he says, Namaka Ohawiki is where one of the piers are. He talks about a place called Ka'ahelu, which is an area that had a village as well as a fish pond. This is probably somewhere near, um, the used to be Bay, Bay Clinics, but now it's a different kind of uh, program that's set up at, that, at one of the houses there right by Orchid Manor. That would be a great reference for Hilo folks. And then he takes us to Kanakia. So Kanakia, people know it as Cold Pond, um, a large brackish pond where he notes um, the Kua Ohina. This is the Hina's Tapa Anvil is located. So again, even this information, Kua Ohina, is not something that um, you know, I necessarily remember hearing or learning about. Um, this pond is also, famed for a sinkhole that's called Kalua Koko, which in one of the books published by Marika Venapukui, there is a story about that. So Nalimu really helps us to really build back up the knowledge that is embedded within these particular places beyond, you know, just that mo'olelo of Kalua Koko. And then he continues on, I mean, it continues, this document continues on. He then goes along the Reeds Bay coastline, wrapping around Coconut Island, uh, Moku'ola, and talking about different places there. So just some things to think about in terms of this document. And I'm one of those researchers where these are publicly available documents. So if you'd like to see them for yourselves, please email me. I'll have my email at the end of this presentation because the point of doing this kind of research for me is to get this information back out to the community so that we can look, relearn together so that we can have conversations about different spellings of place names, um, not necessarily trying to encourage, you know, which one is correct or which one is, is, is heva or wrong, but really understanding that there are multiple spellings, multiple interpretations of these places, and all of them are important um, to remember and to talk about so that we build a sense of 
not necessarily ownership, but sense of place and a sense of caring for those places once more in ways that we don't necessarily do today. So when I look at this particular document, it's very evident to me that he wasn't necessarily in a car with Kelsey going from place to place. As a 95 year old at this time, as he's doing it, he was blind. He couldn't see by this point, he had cataracts. And so here is a, a kupuna that is being prompted to think about these places and he's remembering it in his mind's eye, which helps us to explain why he's jumping from Kelkaha to P.O.P.O. back to the end of the road in King's Landing because he's remembering these things as it's coming to his mind. The use of his Makai and Mauka directionals also helps us to, again, more so as a historical lesson that, um, you know, the ways I might use it might not necessarily be, be how he used it. So really trying to figure out that context is important when we're working with these kind of documents. Um, he talked about places in Kelkaha and as I mentioned, places in P.O.P.O. And he provides the boundaries for the broader Ahupua'a of Waiakea. And where possible, he also inserts his own memories of those places, like talking about growing sweet potato with his, with his parents um, near Keonekaha at that place known as Naola'a. And again, you know, what I really find exciting about this document is that these are names he would have learned as a young person in the mid 19th century. Quite an older set of names from more standard documents we have in the community, which a lot of it document the names of elders who are living in the early to mid 20th century. So it helps us to think about these generational differences we may see, which gets us into our next Wakai Hale. And I'll try to, to speed things up because I know I'm, I'm going a little bit over time. But this is the second Wakai Hale. This was one that Kelsey did with this woman pictured here, Mary Ka'o Lani. Um, Pahi o Ka'ai. Now she, Pahi o Ka'ai is two different last names because she got married twice. Unfortunately, um, her first husband uh, was exiled to Kalaupapa and passed away. And her second husband, um, she married and passed away a year later, sadly. I would love to learn more about who Ka'o Leonalani is because um, Kelsey really relied on her and Nalimu for information of Hilo. And Nal and as Nalimu notes, Ka'o Leonalani is his niece, although I can't, don't, haven't necessarily traced the exact genealogical connection. But here is the document he produced with uh, Hua Ka'ihe did with her and um, her brother, Kahao Lopua, um, last name Kekawalua. And in this document, he makes it known very clearly that they were traveling in a, a car, in a, in a mobile vehicle as they went along the shoreline. So just to give you some excerpts from this particular document, um, they say, we now started for the house of Kahaolopua. The place where he lives is Kaiolevai is so-called, he says, because a rat got into a calabash of potato poi, which is left to sour for three days and was drowned. Uh, this incident happened in the time of his father and other relatives. So here we're seeing a name that was contemporarily made at that time to refer to and to memorize this I assume that they would have memorized it because who would want a dead rat in their poi? Nobody. <laughs> and so it was something that they, that they wanted to memorialize through this place name. In the document, it also says that Kahaolopua says that keo kaha was so called because only potato was raised there and that fish was exchanged for poi with hilo paliku. So here, another story encapsulated in this one sentence. Uh, this, the meaning of keo kaha he provides here is referring to the fact that the land um, is not as productive as other places along our island. If we're thinking about Waipio, where you can grow thousands and thousands of pounds of, of taro, um, Kelkaha's Aina, Kelkaha's lands is more rocky, shallow soil, not fully developed. And so sweet potato is something that can grow well in those kind of conditions. And so this gives us the, the translation of Kelkaha as, um, as death, Kelkaha, which refers to a place that is unproductive. And this particular definition is much different from the standard definitions we get from, for example, if you look up Kelkaha in Pukui's place names of Hawaii, I believe it's um, the passing current, right? Not saying that that is a wrong definition because Kelkaha is a seaward place. It has currents. Um, there's also another definition from other Kelkaha families that talk about Kelkaha as the time of writing which also corresponds with some of the place names we have, like Keone Kahakaha that I mentioned, 
which is a story about children sketching and drawing in the sand itself. So all of these names give us different ways to think about um, that particular place and what it means. So he also then, they also go on to talk about Keokea. Let me move this. So Keokea, which was so named um, because of the white hala that used to grow there, hala keokeo. Um, and lei is made from this hala that were given from one sex to the other. And these lei were, were gifts termed o, which is also the term that they use for luncheon called o. And so, you know, it's just another example of this really specific information they're sharing about these places. Lokoaka, they also note in, in their huaka'ihele should not be spelled lokoaka with no w, because lokoaka, waka, is actually the name of somebody. Waka is the name of a mo'o, of a reptilian deity, who I won't share it in this story, but um, was chased here by Pele um, because of an incident. And Lokowaka, well, not Lokowaka, Waka was the grandmother of Laie Ikavai. And um, in the document itself, what makes it interesting is Kelsey gives Nalimu um, the opportunity to make his own comments. So he's reading back his huaka'i hele with ka'o liona lani and ka'o lopua. And you see in these margins, these notes added by Nalimo. So here he says, um, o kahiva kaino kahiko. Kahiva is the ancient name of this part in, of this place. He's referring to a place in Hono Hononui. There's a lot of these interjections he makes within this particular document, either agreeing with his niece or disagreeing or saying, no, it's over here, not over there, as they're saying. So in one section, for example, he says, um, you know, they're talking about places within this particular area. They named Kahiva, which was referring to a lowland area somewhere nearby. Kapu'upili, um, which has a lake of the na same name, out of sight, um, next to a garage. Pu'u'o Kamali'i, which is where cho school children played, uh, located on Princess Powahi Bishop's land, low and rough. And here is an example of one of those interjections he gives. Ohono hono nui ka aino pihopa, a ole o pu'u o kamali nalimo. Makayako kahiva o na o laa. Makayako na o laa o keone kahakaha. Makayako keone kahakaha o hono hono nui. And it goes on and on. And here is an example where he's saying, no, hono hono nui is the lands of bishop estate, not pu'u o kamali, as his niece says. And in this section, he's saying, kahiva is makai of this of na o laa. And Ola'a is Makaya of Keone Kahakaha. And so he's going through and kind of listing these names again because, you know, when he's hearing these, the names of this other Huakai, he's, he's thinking, wait a minute, no, it's over here. These are, this is the sequence that should be presented. Here we go. So Kaiole Vais here is mentioned in that part. And let's continue on really quickly. There's also a part where they're talking about Kaule Kahe. So this is a point out here. Um, this is from Kealohapaka, four miles that, that they recently repaved that parking lot. And here they talk about Moku'ulu, which is on the left of Wayaka. Um, Kaule Kahe, they talk say Kahe Kaule on Akeki Malaila. This is where children were brought to perform circumcisions. Um, by the beach, also a place that they note for good swimming. Nalimu also adds, um, above this place or mauka of this place is a place known as Moku'ulu, which was an Aina Kauhale, a place where you had many, many Kauhale and village sites. They also then talk about other places and ponds in Hono Hononui, such as Kapalaho, Kiono Kapahu. Um, one of my favorites in this list, they talk about Papakahakaha, a stretch of Pahoi Hoi marked with names where he, where there used to be a school of hundred or so pupils attended by Nalimo. Um, the building was of cane leaves, the rocks were covered with moenas. So although unfortunately a lot of these Pahoi Hoi rocks were covered when they built this road, there's still, you know, this is the part, this is the Pahoi Hoi right, you pass by it if you drive through this road and people still write and etch on it, which I, I love to see because you can literally see, literally see that the name is talking about that action of writing on this papa, uh, on this um, pahoi hoi flats. So 
Now Limo at this point when they're talking about Papa Kaha Kaha, he's like, that's not, he's like, hold on. Lokoaka is the name for the larger area. Um, Kapapa Kaha Kaha is where the schoolhouse was. So he's helping us to identify where he went to school in Kilkaha. We, we knew that a school existed um, through research in Hawaiian language newspapers, but not exactly where it was. He tells us exactly where it is. So if I take folks to this place, I can point exactly where these places are to folks. He then, um, in Kaol, they then talk about places like Mahikea, which they also spell Mahaikea. Um, this would be the larger island here. They also talk about Hawani'o. Kau Maui, you know, I'm placing it here off into the distance, but we also, there's competing accounts. Um, there is an account that situates it where the old Kapuni house used to be, which is my Ohana. Um, and that property is actually closer to the park that is now named Waiolena where Hui Ho'ole Maluo, for folks who know, um, are doing work there to rehabilitate the ponds there. So that information tells us maybe Kaumaui is farther down, but it's still undecided at this point. So just some really quick wrap-up thoughts of this Hua um, when, when Kelsey performs this with Kao Leonalani and Kahao Lopua, they're doing it in an automobile. They're not necessarily sitting somewhere like Nalimu and, and remembering it. They're actively doing a huaka ihele and showing Kelsey all these places. Um, and like the document I shared previously, Nalimus huaka'i ka'o leo nalani, huaka ihele includes place names along the Waiakea coastline beyond Keokaha, including the names of ponds and pio pio. Ka'o leo nalani also introduces Kelsey to her brother, Kahao Lopua, when providing these names. And he provides some really great information on the name, the meaning of different names in Keokaha. And you know, when I look at the documents, I, I'm also trying to imagine the how they were created. Excuse me. And so here we see in this particular document um, how Nalimu is given the opportunity to correct um, what he thinks is the, the, the accurate kind of places where these names belong. And as we see, and again, if folks want to see the documents, let me know, um, they're remembering these places very differently. This is a direct quote from um, Ka'o Leonalani and Kahao Lopua's Huaka'ihele. And I really enjoy this particular section because it's talking about, you know, they, they were driving through Kelkaha and at some point it started to rain. And so they sat in the car and Kelsey, he says, I was told that the shower, which Kahao Lopua thought might be of considerable length because there was no wind, I was told that this was the way the kupuna said thank you for recording the place names. So this was a great reaffirmation for things that I learned, right, as a Hawaiian charter school student of watching for ho'ailona, these signs from the natural world that tell us we're doing the right thing. We're sharing the information that we should be sharing. And that, you know, oftentimes I think in the moment of, of revitalization and reconstruction, we have doubts about whether or not it's, you know, the correct thing to do. And here is a great example from 1925 of people saying, yeah, there's Ho'ailona. If th this rain is a recognition that what you're doing and preserving these place names is making our kupuna, our ancestors, happy. So that will kind of end the formal part of my talk. Um, thanks you, everybody, for staying and, and following along with this Hele. I know I've been a little bit just jumbled, but I hope you folks had a lot to consider with regard to the different places within Kilkaha. I hope this inspires others to really, um, you know, pick up these documents or talk to Kupuna that they may know about these places and to just share space um, to learn more about these places, to learn from each other about our experiences in these places so that we're invested in protecting them to ensure that, you know, the places that may be sacred um, can be um, cared for once more within that um, respect. If you are interested in, in these two documents, again, these are publicly accessible documents. Um, these aren't necessarily things I want to hoard or become the expert on because ultimately this work is about getting people in, or inspiring people um, to take it up within their own families, within their own lives and to find meaning. If you're interested, um, send me an email at the email here and I will share those documents with you and we can have a conversation or you can take it and you can, you know, take it with your family to walk along the coast to see if you find any useful information um, um, or if it helps 
to just learn about those places. Okay, I will stop there. And any questions folks may have, please ask. I see Kessel asked, you can purchase, so where can we purchase Detour? I believe there's copies at Basically Books. Um, if not there, you can certainly buy a copy of it on Amazon. Oh, let me really quickly, um, I am enabling the unmute option. That was just so that, um, you know, we didn't have any, um, any people unmuting in between the presentation, but it, please, if you have any questions, you can ask it in the chat or, um, you know, unmute yourself and ask your questions. I'd like to speak up. Um, and first, before I ask a question, I will say mahalo. That was just so um, illuminating. And I think it's really eye-opening for those of us who maybe don't have those uh, same visceral connections to places here on the Big Island, but to know that they exist and to appreciate that that these are very meaningful places to people is, uh, I think, very important of being a Malahini here. So I do have one question for you. I thought that that um, the Fujikani, uh, Fujikani um, statement about the logic of subdivision being based on private ownership, clearly that is not appropriate in terms of local Hawaiian culture, but that doesn't mean that there aren't boundaries because you, um, like you've put up the map in right. your presentation showing Waiakea boundaries, and you're talking about some of the ponds were in Hano Hano Nui versus Popo. So, mm -hmm. what would be the appropriate characteristics to establish boundaries between places? Oh, that's a great question, Carol. Um, my immediately my mind goes to um, one part of this question has to deal with re-educating folks about traditional Hawaiian boundaries, which is ongoing work. Um, you know, I mentioned ahupua'a, but I didn't necessarily describe, you know, what an ahupua'a is. An ahupua'a is essentially a land, a large land division that en encompasses resources within the mountains in Mocha and coastal resources, oftentimes pie-shaped. Um, Waiakea is the main ahupua, the largest ahupua'a on this island and encompasses most of Pu'ainako, most of Waiakea Uka, Waiakea Waina. So that is first and foremost, just the basic kind of land category that many folks across the islands have been working to re-educate, you know, folks living on the islands about the importance of those places. But even in ahupua'a, as I've mentioned, there are other kind of boundary, um, Hawaiian boundaries, such as the ili. Ili is a smaller land division, and Ili Kupono is another type of smaller land division reserved for the chiefs. And then when we talk about lai or points that I've mentioned, like Keokea or Makahanaloa, those serve as other kinds of boundaries between places. So it's not that, um, you know, sometimes people think that, that we didn't, that we were a little bit more fluid with our boundaries, which we were, um, but there are definitely very definable ways in which we dissected the land. And the differences of that, of those palena or those boundaries between essentially land private practices is that what happens oftentimes with land privatization is that it means there is somebody who then determines access to those places. And as we know, um, this can be quite contentious with the native Hawaiian communities because sometimes private properties restrict people from accessing gathering grounds um, other materials that they may have and their family may have used in the past. And so when she talks about this kind of logic of subdivision, it's the ways in which um, the ways we understand and, and we essentially practice private property is one that can cut off access to, um, that people need to maintain these kinds of stories and practices within their families. Um, we see it oftentimes, especially within coastal communities, because those who have essentially the money to buy really expensive coastal properties, um, sometimes if they don't quite understand um, land laws here, they may think that they can restrict that access when there are very clearly identifiable laws, especially around Native Hawaiian access rights, that says otherwise. Um, you know, to, to make a really long the second lecture, it's much shorter. It's that it's 
it's a really clear illustration of the ongoing competition between Hawaiian values and introduced values and introduced systems that we continue to grapple with today um, as we reconstruct our own history, as we relearn that history, and as we reconnect with these places that for many, um, those, those ties have been severed because of you know, all kinds of processes, whether if we wanted to talk about it as Americanization or becoming kind of private citizens who have to um, work full time and get wage labors, all those things have had different impacts in our communities that we continue to kind of unpack and unravel through this kind of research. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? I, I, it is getting late and it's Friday night, so people may want to uh, go out, but we could take one more question if, if necessary. I see Christine has asked one about Theodore Kelsey. And thank you for asking, Christine, because I didn't really, um, in this presentation, I didn't do a great job of talking about who Kelsey was. So Theodore Kelsey is quite an interesting person. Um, he would be like a contemporary with Mary Kavena Fukui. He was not Native Hawaiian. He moved to the islands when he was very young. Um, he was an amateur ethnographer, and, uh, and, uh, somebody who essentially went around and talked to all the old folks in Hilo because he wanted to learn more about the, the, the different places in Hilo, the histories. But he was also, within that time period, one of those folks who recognized that much of this knowledge was being lost with the passing of these elders. And so hence, you know, people like Nalimu and Ka'o Leonalani were those that he was able to meet through the work that he did. He took photographs of folks, which you can access at the Hawaiian Historical Archive. He documented their stories in place names, which is those that I've mentioned here at the Hawaii State Archives. And he was really active in the mid 20th century, really advocating for the preservation of Hawaiian culture. Um, if you look back at very early Hilo Tribune Herald publications, he would write these editorials and share some of the stories he learned from the folks in Hilo. And so you see this, this, this man in his career, well, his actual career was as a photographer. Um, but outside of that, he did a lot of work to preserve these stories, to correspond with folks, and to create this archive that we now have access to that over the decades folks have utilized for different kinds of projects. But um, in the future, if, if I get the chance, I would love to be able to just sit and think through just all of what he collected. Um, and in particular, his Hilo interlocutors, because I'm, I grew up in Hilo and these are you know the names and the people that he met in the 1920s, also a period I'm quite interested in because this is when Kilkaha is established as a Hawaiian homeland community. Um, you know, people that in the everyday Hawaiian community in Kilkaha and Hilo now that we may not necessarily hear too much about. Everybody knows who Auntie Edith Kanaka Ole is, but what about Henry Nalimo, right? Also intriguing, interesting man who lived 95 years and had a really full life in Hilo in the Gilbert Islands. Um, for me, it, it gets back to, to doing the really hard work of revisiting histories that we still haven't quite done yet. And it's what kind of keeps me going because it's super exciting to go through these documents and to kind of put the pieces together and to try to um, figure out where these places are so that, you know, when I do my puka shell tour guides, as I've been told I can be sometimes, um, you know, I can tell people this is what this place is. And these, this is the information that we know from these various sources on the significance of those places, on the spelling of these names. Um, and Kelsey is somebody locally in Hilo that does that for us. And, um, you know, it's important to recognize that knowledge source because not all communities across Hawaii have documents like that. Um, so the fact that we do is really, the onus is on us to make sure that those things come back into living memory and we pass that um, onto our our keiki, our children. Okay, well, I will, I will agree with Christine's comment about a, a history of Hilo for people to read. That would be a great idea. Um, we probably should close down now. I don't think you ran over uh, Helena. I think it was wonderful, really great. So, uh, I'm going to uh, end the meeting now with a thank you very, very much for doing this. It's great. So, oh, my. Wow.
pleasure. And thank you, everybody, again, for joining us today um, and learning a little bit about Keokaha. I hope you folks enjoyed kind of being able to go from place to place. I know I wasn't as, um, you know, maybe it wasn't as here's the place and this is what it is kind of presentation. But I hope it really gave folks a lot to consider about, um, you know, moving across different landscapes, the ways that we talk about our own family histories of movement across different places, on an, whether it's through Hawaii or through different places. And I also, you know, I'd, I'd end and really encourage folks to, if you're on island, to come to Keokaha, go to Waiuli, um, go to Keokaha Beach Park, go to Keonekahakaha, and just sit in those places and really imagine what life was like before the beach parks. Um, when there were still very viable communities thriving in those places, where these place names are a part of everyday life as opposed to just these kind of special moments of huaka'i hele. Because ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, I think for me, when I do this work, it's about feeling reaffirmed in my ancestors, but also feeling confident in knowing where I'm from and knowing that information and passing that on to the next generation in hopes that it helps them feel empowered to protect these very special places along our coastline. Okay, well, that's, that is a wonderful wrap-up comment. Thank you so much, Helena. It was a privilege to listen to you. Thank you, and take care, everybody. Take care.